Welcome everyone to the UNC Virtual Science Expo. Woo! In this all day science expo event, we will be highlighting UNC researchers from all around the world. How often is that? My name is Tamara Poles and this is my co-host Jonathan Frederick. And we will be here, uh, we are broadcasting here from UNC uh, chap in Chapel Hill, and we and the building that we're in is Moorhead Planetarium and Science Center. And actually, we have something coming up. Jonathan, what's coming up first? First up today on an exciting jam-packed day is STEM story time. We'll get started in a few seconds. Nice. Well, I will see you later. Oh, we're gonna get started right now. Bye, Tamara. <laughs> see you at ten o'clock. Tamara is gonna be talking to a shark researcher and discussing all sorts of things that happen around the world for marine conservation. But right now, what we're here to do is learn about science through the art of storytelling. Before we dive into the topic, I would like to do two things. One, everyone in this room, there's only four people in this giant room is vaccinated, but we're all still wearing our masks and staying physically distant when possible. But right now, since I'm all by myself in this big space, I'm gonna take my mask off, say hello. And I would like to also say hello to a couple of our featured classrooms who are on the call. So if I look at my handy dandy sheet here, I can see that we have Smyrna Elementary, hello or Smyrna Elementary, I think, Down East Middle, Alderman Elementary, and the Curtis Center. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. We hope you have a good time today. Well, it's now time for STEM story time. And did you know that on this incredible campus, this Research One University, just over that way across the beautiful quad is a place where they research the development of children. It's called the Frank Porter Graham Child Development Institute. It was founded in 1966 by a small group of scientists who had a vision to conduct research that would make a difference in children's lives. They do incredible work. And since, since its inception, FPG has recognized that every child deserves a safe, healthy, and stimulating childhood. What an incredible mission. And we're really lucky to have some experts with us today, both at nine o'clock and then also later on at 4 p.m. where you can tune in. This morning, we have none other than Sarah Pedanti. She's been an innovative leader from of the field of inclusive early childhood education in roles ranging from inclusive preschool teacher, and she also works with education and disabilities. She's done a lot of work and is working on her PhD. She's gonna be Dr. Pedanti here pretty soon. But for now, I'd like to turn it over and let Sarah say hello to everyone. And she has some special guests with her as well. Hey, Sarah. Hi, everyone. So I'm representing with my UNC this morning. I went to UNC for undergraduate and first became interested in research then and uh, left, got my master's degree and I'm back for a PhD. And I have two little assistants this morning here to help me. They're my own little research scientist. This is Iris. Can you say hi? Hi. And this is Susie. What do you say? Hi. Iris is five and Susie is how old? Two. Two. And they're going to be helping me read this book this morning as sort of an example of some of the dialogic reading techniques um, that we use and that researchers at Frank Porter Graham um, have focused on in their research and helping understand how we can support children's academic language and their literacy skills. Um, so I'm going to get started with a book that we've picked out for you this morning. The group I work with um, focuses on STEM learning for young children with and without disabilities. And we've done some work on how you can embed those STEM concepts into storybooks. And so the book we've picked out this morning that I'm gonna get ready to share with you is Mom, called what is that thing? The Hike. The Hike. Here we go. The Hike is for Kara at the river. That's right, there's kids at the river. Can you um, grab my cord for me and have my charger cords over there? Thanks. I just realized my battery uh, is a little low, surprisingly, so I'm gonna get it all charged up. So this book is called The Hike. And in our house, we really enjoy hiking. I see some things here that we take when we go backpacking and getting ready to hike. Mom, it's over there. Uh, I see a binocular. I see sweatshirts. What do you see, Iris? A backpack. Yeah, backpack. What do we use the backpack for? Hey, what Sarah. Happened? Yes. Sarah, sorry, sorry to interrupt. It looks like we're seeing something else on your screen. Oh, interesting. So you want, definitely want to make sure we see those ah. really, really pretty visuals from that book. Ah. Okay. Let's make sure that I've shared the right thing. Let's try again. 
It looks like the screen is not there. So I'm just going to have to share my desktop and then go over. Can you see it now? Not yet. Okay. We, we sort of trialed this right before we got on everyone. So hopefully, that there we go. Promising. There we go. Here we go. Okay. Okay. Well, I'll get you a drink in just a minute. So just like all parents and teachers, uh, this is going to be sort of a real world simulation of what it's like when you're reading with small children. So, um, you know, I beg a little bit of um, uh, patience from you no! all if we have those real world interruptions. Uh, so this is the book. It's called The Hike, and it's by author Allison Farrell. Don't talk. And Iris, are you ever an author? Do you ever write books? Sometimes we work on that together with markers and paper. Uh -oh. Here we go. And so uh, you might have all just seen a little bit of the actual research I work on open in one of my statistical programs. Sorry about that. Uh, my daughter swiped left. So here is the book. And it looks like we have several characters in this book that have packed different things for um, going on a hike and camping. All right. And it looks like maybe they've got a book and some pencils they use to record their observations hiking. There they are. They're saying, yoo-hoo, almost ready to hike. Just one more cut, just a few more feathers. What do you think they're getting ready for their hike? What do you think they're getting ready, Iris? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It looks like maybe they're collecting some paper and some other objects to take with them. How many friends are going to go on this hike? It looks like three friends. Let's see what happens next. We are going on a hike. Wren, L, Hattie, and their dog, Bean. It's our favorite thing to do. And it looks like this blue jay is saying, shuk, 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 shuk. that's the noise they make. I also see mushrooms and owls. She prefers water. She doesn't drink milk anymore. Sorry. Someone's complaining about being thirsty and we've got a helper here on the sidelines. And it looks like that one of the girls is saying, hey, wait for me. In the beginning, we run like maniacs. Do you run when we go hiking? Do you run? Yeah, sometimes it's fun to get off our energy in the woods. Until a ripe patch of thimbleberries slows us down. Why do you think it slowed them down? What are they doing? Are they smelling those berries or are they eating them? Oh, yummy. Do we like berries? Yes, we eat lots of berries. When you're out on a hike, always make sure that you ask a grown up about if the berries are safe before you eat them. Okay, we may have one with that. All right. So those friends slowed down. Why did they slow down, Susie? Because they're eating the berries. That's right. Yummy. Elle teaches us how to make leaf baskets. They're using their sketchbook to follow the directions. And you all at home might see I'm pointing to the screen. And if I had the hard copy book here with me, I'd be print referencing as we talked to help make that connection between what I'm reading and what's in the book. Oh, the girls say we may have eaten too many berries. Is that possible? And she said, I thought we were saving some for later. Did they eat them all? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you do that when you have berries? If I give you a pint, do you eat a little of the berries or all of them? You eat all of them. You get pretty hungry. And I think they hear a woodpecker saying, pat, 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 pat. Have you ever heard a woodpecker? Yeah. Where have you heard a woodpecker at? <laughs> at Allison's house where we go to daycare. The hike gets steep and the trail narrows. And one of the friends, Hattie, says, boo! And her friends say, ah, how'd you get up there so fast? They get lost. 
they're looking at their maps and saying, hmm, which way is north? And another friend says, pretty sure we weren't supposed to cross a river just yet. Hmm, what do you think they should do? Should they maybe use their map to try to find out where to go? Yeah, we have some maps at our house we've used when we've gone on hikes. Now they're thinking about how to find their way back. They've got their sketchbook with the directions and they're gonna take a break in the tree. One friend says, did we go left after the berry patch? And another says, right, I think. What's another word for blue? Azure, cerulean, cobalt. Those are all fancy words for blue. Mm -hmm. She's writing some directions in her sketchbook. I wonder if they can find their way. In no time at all, they get back on track. And he looks at the map and says, we're halfway there. And they're drawing the things they see. What are one of the things they see here beside the stream? What are those? Those are footprints. It looks like animal tracks in the woods. Do you ever see animal tracks in the woods? Yeah, what kinds? Dog tracks. You see dog tracks sometimes? Yeah, and, and, and deer tracks. And deer tracks, that's true. There are a lot of deer around our house. Maybe some of you all's too. <gasps> Speaking of deer, one just walks past and Bean sneezes. The dog must be allergic to the deer. He says, achoo. The deer vanishes so quick, we wonder if it was ever really there. A light rain comes and goes. The birds are happy. We listen to them chirp and chatter in the trees. And they said, look, this is the river we were looking for, right, Hattie? So they used their map to find the Blue River. And they've got their sketchbook drawing all the different birds they're seeing. Hummingbirds and bluebirds and chickadees. What are some birds that you see on hikes, Iris? Chickadee. Yeah. What are, can you think of any others? I don't know. Maybe woodpeckers? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Hattie gets tired and Elle offers to carry her. Whew, she got worn out. They got close to the waterfall and it was so loud. We can't hear you. I said, 30 minutes to the top. They're getting closer and closer to the top of their hike. Soon, Elle is tired too. Have you ever been tired on a hike? What do we do when we get tired? Who carries you? Uh -huh. Mommy. Mommy or daddy? Yeah. Mommy. Yeah. Now they're carrying all the friends together. Giddy up. And she says, I can't do this much longer. Ride's almost over, everyone. We're close to the top. Brr, it's getting chilly. Why do you think they're feeling cold? It's, it's getting cold. It's getting cold. They're in short sleeve shirts and they're getting towards the top of the mountain. Sometimes it's colder the higher you get on a mountain. Did you know that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When we go up in the mountains, we pack warm clothing. At the top, Wren takes out her flag, Elle reads her poem, and Hattie releases her feathers into the wind. Remember at the beginning when she was collecting those feathers? Uh -huh. Where'd she get them from? I don't know. From the chickens. Uh -huh. And she's releasing them into the wind so they can blow away. That looks beautiful. We did it! Now the sun is going down and there is a what? What's that on the page? Sunset. A sunset, that looks beautiful. Have you ever seen a beautiful sunset at the end of a long hike? Yes. Mm -hmm. What colors did you see? Pink and orange. Pink and orange and blue. Sometimes when you're high up on a mountain, it's a good position to see really great sunsets. The sky and the clouds and the atmosphere up high what can make really beautiful colors. What is that? The atmosphere is the air that's all around our earth and it changes when you go higher and higher up and that's why you can see some beautiful sunsets up high. Oh look at that. It's getting late. What did they see up in the sky? I don't know. 
Those look like constellations. Can you say that word? Constellations. Yes, constellations are beautiful arrangements of stars in the sky. You can go outside at home, especially if you live somewhere outside of the city where there aren't too many lights and look up. And if it's not a cloudy night, you can see all the different stars and have a grown up help you find how they connect to make constellations. So sometimes you can see different figures and shapes in the stars. And um, scientists who study the sky, astronomers, call those constellations. Can you say that word, Susie? Constellations. Oh, that's a very big word. Nice job. And here are some notes from Ren's sketchbook. She wanted to remember things she saw on the hike. So she drew a picture of the Stellar's J. Do you remember the noise that Stellar's J made? Mm. It wasn't a tweet tweet. It was kind of a different noise. Shook, 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 shook. And she saw some barred owlets. Do you guys know what sound owls make? Oh, that's right. And Hattie says barred owls sound like this. They say, who cooks for you? Who cooks for you all? <laughs> And the other owl says, why does she keep asking? No one ever cooks for us. That's so silly. Her notes say that stellar jays can be smart and noisy and that barred owls like to make that who noise. And then she drew some pictures of dead trees. Dead trees decompose and can be food for animals and other young trees in the forest. You see one tree is upright growing and one tree is down on the ground decomposing. Have you ever seen anything decomposing in our yard uh -uh. or Allison and Tim's? Mm -mm. I've seen some things, leaves decompose and trees. You can see all of those out in the woods. She also saw swarms of bees of, oh, it looks like worker female bees and queens. And the drone is a male bee. Those are all different parts of the beehive. Oh. I a snake. You see a snake. That's the ribbon that holds her place in the book. And it looks like she drew pictures of all the different invasive plants she saw. So ivy is an invasive plant. We like to get rid of that so the native plants can thrive. Mom, that looks like a tongue. It does a little bit. That's a ribbon. It's called a bookmark where you can keep your place in a book you're working on. But, but, but your shot looks like that. A little bit. Pink. Some uh, snakes, maybe tongues look really long. Ours isn't though. I, they look like a snake. It Mom, does a little bit. Mom, do you know? Do you know? Even fox tongues are, are long too. Yeah. She drew a lot of they, different animals in here. I wonder about a deer. Do you think their tongue is long? Uh, what about this slug? Slugs uh, are long and slimy. Mm -hmm. this is yeah, it does a little bit. In some woods out in the Pacific Northwest, that's a long way from here, there are big slugs called banana slugs. And you know, they're like this big. They're the second largest yeah, slug in the world. I got a ladybug, yeah. yeah, and some other bugs. I also see some mushrooms mm. and um, some different kinds of flowers. Mm -hmm. So when you go out in the woods, do you draw pictures of what you see? of thimble berries and horse tails and leaves. Oh, and I even see a porcupine and a beaver. Oh, oh I saw a beaver at, at, the, at, uh, uh, I don't know. At the creek? No, at, uh, at the museum. Oh, at the museum, that's right. We went to the Natural History Museum in Raleigh a few weeks ago, and they have a great exhibit of North Carolina's habitat. We went to the and, farm. Yeah, and the farm. And there are wetlands in North Carolina that have lots of beavers. I highly recommend going, and it's free if you're ever in Raleigh. That's the Natural History Museum. All right. We've been there. Before. And I see some stands of trees and a plunge waterfall. Do you remember seeing a waterfall on any of our hikes? Uh, I saw a little one. Yeah, we've seen some little ones and maybe even some big ones when we were up camping in the mountains. Oh, mom, I think, I think, but do you know a really tall one? Yeah, we saw a really tall one once in the mountains. Remember, you threw rocks in it.
pretty cool. And if you're local to the triangle, there are some waterfalls you can see um, uh, near the Noose River right outside Raleigh and some at the Eno River here in Durham. And that is the end of our book. So Iris, what do you bring along on your hikes? I bring some books and some and jackets and stuff in my backpack. That's a great idea. I would love to hear if there are other kids and classrooms uh, on this call that would like to tell us about what you take on a hike. Oh, and I bring up, even I bring my hat. Yeah. I don't have That's a hat. great plan to keep your um, head warm. Yeah, if anyone on the call would like to enter into the Q&A feature, something you take on a hike or any comments or your favorite parts of the story, we'd love to see what you thought. I thought it was incredible. I work at a planetarium, so I, of course, really like the night sky part with the constellations. So we'll give folks a minute to, to see if they want to ask any questions or enter any answers to our questions. Wow. What is it? And while we're waiting on uh, kids to answer, one of my colleagues, Ching, who works um, on, is one of the um, investigators on the STEMI project um, has some links that she can drop in the Q&A for interested teachers and parents as some of our resources um, that connect to this book and can help you think about activities to do in nature and while outside on hikes. So I'm going to take a look at the Q&A and see if any of our friends have had any questions for us. Someone really likes water. So you mentioned a couple of great places to see some water. Uh, Eno, the Eno River in Durham. And where's the one in Raleigh? Uh, the Noose River. If you go up north, uh, northeast of Raleigh, Falls of the Noose has some waterfalls as you go out of Raleigh. I'm just adjusting my legs so I can be comfortable too. Now I noticed as you were reading, you were doing some interesting things for any parents or educators on the call. And I have a little bit of training in story, story reading, but you were doing some interesting, subtle things there. Um, what do you recommend when someone's reading a story to a, to a big audience of children? Yeah, so um, there is an evidence-based technique called dialogic reading. Uh, and dialogic reading has been um, studied with lots of um, larger groups of children in many classrooms. And it shows, um, if you use these particular techniques, it has good results on kids' vocabulary and their narrative inferencing or ability to understand stories. And so one of the main uh, techniques of dialogic reading is called crowd. And if you click on some of those links that Ching's gonna share in our chat, you can go to our website and find more crowd resources. Crowd stands for um, completion, which is, giving an open-ended sentence um, that your child can fill in the word for. Recall, which is answering questions about the story. Open-ended questions um, like, um, what do you think will happen next? WH questions like who, what, where, um, and distancing. And that's kind of how I connected with Iris and Susie about hikes we've taken and places we've been. That's how you distance. You connect the topic of the book to your child's personal experience. Very cool. Now you made the uh, mistake of accidentally showing us a research shot of yes. on your computer. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about what you do uh, in your daily work. Yeah, so I work with large data sets. Um, excuse me, I'm speaking. Okay. okay, well, if you'd like to move into the middle of my lap, you're welcome to. So this is real world with kids and, and research. Um, so I work on research um, that primarily investigators before me. Um, so there's lots of wonderful researchers at UNC Psychology and Education um, who've done lots of big research projects with kids and collected big data sets that represent lots of families, children, and classrooms. And I do a lot of secondary analysis with that kind of data, looking for patterns between the kinds of teaching practices um, that children can learn from and their outcomes so that we can know what best supports children's learning. Um, but we know that there's lots of um, practical aspects of implementation. And so I also look at, um, you know, what are sort of the realistic um, implementation conditions that allow teachers and parents to be successful in teaching their children. So as we all know, real children are wiggly and uh, excitable sometimes. And so we have to adapt even these ideal teaching practices sometimes to real world conditions. Absolutely. And this may be a tough question to answer in these circumstances, but uh, are you finding 
or, or looking into anything that's happened that's different during the pandemic? Like Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I'm working with a researcher right now in the School of Education. Um, no. Oh, wait, wait a second. Are you taking your hands in your lap? Here, do you want to go see Mimi for a second? We've got a, a grandparent here in the uh, in the wings. There you go. Hi, Mimi. <laughs> Say hi. So, hi. like like many families, we're sort of doing the multi generational uh, juggling work, virtual yeah. school, daycare right now, and, and very fortunate to have a grandparent around to help. Um, so, one of the researchers in the School of Ed right now just finished doing um, a big survey of families across North Carolina, especially in rural areas on the virtual learning practices they're using um, during COVID. And uh, we asked some questions about parent stressors during COVID and um, how are looking to see about how that relates to the practices they use. Mom, get this okay, I can hold that. No, I'll get so it. I'm sure parents it's can easy. empathize. Go ahead. Uh, you can be juggling lots of different things sometimes and um, having strategies that you can um, use with your children to support their virtual learning and um, work within the real constraints of working from home, potentially having kids at home virtually um, is important. So that there's lots of great research starting to come out um, from UNC School of Ed and um, from Frank Porter Graham Child Development Institute on COVID and those kind of learning conditions during it. Um, my child is in a virtual pre-K right now. And so I'm hoping her class was able to, to join us and um, we're learning lots more about the kinds of virtual um, book reading and story contexts um, that kids can learn from over the computer. Outstanding. Well, Sarah, thank you so much for being with us today and for introducing us to your beautiful family. We really sure. appreciate it. We certainly acknowledge particularly with all the teachers and students on the call. What an incredible year it's been, unprecedented, and we respect and appreciate everything you're doing. And we're wishing you the best. Help is on the way. <laughs> Things are getting better. Um, is there anything else you'd wanna share in terms of, we'll share some resources from your amazing website and what the FPG uh, Child Development Institute does. We found that incredible list of STEM stories, mm -hmm. and that's gonna be part of our follow-up with everyone who's participating today. Is, are there any other things you'd like for folks to know? Yeah, particularly for um, parents of preschoolers, kindergartners, younger elementary children. Um, their, um, as you could just see, their attention span uh, can be limited potentially for um, lots of virtual learning. So make sure you're building in those breaks, particularly if your child is having to be on a screen a lot, uh, making sure they get the opportunity to get outside, um, explore your neighborhood, the parks around you. Um, it can be difficult for young children to sit for a long time. And so um, we want to incorporate lots of opportunities for movement and connect even these book-based literacy experiences to what children are doing outside in the world around them. Thank you so much for that. As a parent of two young children, I've become like <laughs> the most amazing book critic and respectful of like <laughs> incredible books and incredible illustrations. And the hike that you chose today, I think it was emblematic of the type of stories. I I'm gonna go purchase a copy or get one from the library probably uh, late, as soon as I can. So thank you yeah. so much for doing that. Um, we really appreciate your time. Everyone else, um, thank you so much. Thank you for the schools that participated. Um, Courtney commented that uh, I think uh, someone on the call likes to take water on hikes, which is always important when you go out to explore to wear your sunscreen and your, your hats and to definitely take your water so that you can have plenty of energy and stay hydrated when you're out there exploring. Um, we'd also like to thank our sponsors. The North Carolina Science Festival is not possible without the support of the Biogen Foundation, Burroughs Welcome Fund and others. So go to ncsciFest.org to find more events happening all through the month. And next up at 10 o'clock, the top of the hour, we're gonna have a story read by Dr. Alex Hearn, who's a marine biologist who studies sharks. He's gonna be reading to us a story called Marty the Hammerhead. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, everybody else. Enjoy the rest of your day. Bye-bye. Thanks everyone. Bye-bye.